Brothers, let's, let's get started. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, pray that you would sustain me. Pray that you give us all wisdom together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt, for your assistance. Brothers, please forgive my voice. About once a year, God plays this hilarious joke on me where I have to preach, and he takes away my voice. I'm sure many of you have been through that yourselves. I'm going to start with an all-too-typical story of a church planting train wreck, and I want us to think together about what went wrong. And then in the rest of this brief message, I'll show how getting baptism and the Lord's Supper right can give you a whole different plan, a more biblical plan for planting a church. All all of what I'm going to say is relevant to pastoral ministry more broadly, but my focus, my case study is church planting. First, the train wreck. You start with a Bible study in your living room. You gather a core team. Over a few months, you have kind of dry run services. You started with just your wife, three kids, and a dog. But eventually, 20 people are coming, and then 50. And now you've got 70 people gathering together week by week. You're 18 months in, and you're feeling great. People are starting to give financially. Even more important, people are coming to faith. You have a vibrant mercy ministry of community development. You have folks volunteering in local schools. It seems like there's real momentum. There's energy and passion in your weekly services. God is doing something. People are excited. The time seems ripe to formalize what you're doing. So you start talking about membership, about commitment, about covenanting together. You start talking about defining what you believe and what it means to belong And when you do, everything starts coming apart. When you start putting your church's beliefs on paper, you discover that some people are unhappy with you for being such a fundamentalist. They're great with the community service, but they hate the exclusivity of Christ. So they stir up a bunch of theological fights, they call you bad names, and then they leave. When you start talking about church membership, you discover that a whole lot of people have had bad experiences with church membership. You learn that a good number of your gathering are coming to you for a fresh start and a different experience. They thought that you were doing this kind of vague, undefined, no one's really in or out thing on purpose. But now it turns out you're bringing church membership in the back door and they feel betrayed. You're just confirming all their worst fears about what the church is. So they're mad at you. They feel like you've led them on. They also call you bad names. They also stir up fights, but then they stick around. (laughs) They say they're part of the church, and who are you to say they aren't? When you start clarifying what you believe about baptism and the Lord's Supper, you discover that all kinds of people who you think are part of your church are far from being convinced Baptists. Some were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Some have been baptized, but don't exactly think infant baptism is wrong. Some agree with you about believer baptism, but are emphatic that you should not exclude pedo baptists from membership. And all these people want to be part of your church. So what are you going to believe and teach and practice about baptism? Who will your church say are qualified to be recipients of the Lord's Supper? Just how many members of your core team will you alienate if you draw clear lines on these things. So overnight, your church plant morphs from momentum to mess. Instead of your attenders chugging along together, now they're crashing into each other like train cars in a pileup. So what went wrong? The main thing is you tried to plant a church without knowing what a church is. My train wreck story is a composite but it's barely an exaggeration. I could name names. Maybe you're similar with familiar mashups. Maybe you're in the midst of one right now. So what can we do to avoid this carnage? I want to suggest that a necessary, though not sufficient answer, is getting baptism in the Lord's Supper right. Specifically, understand the role that baptism in the Lord's Supper play in making a church a church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are what constitute the church as a church because they enact our commitment to Christ and to each other. 
As a church planter, your goal is to see a church born. Now, only God can bring a church into existence. But as a church planter, you're like a midwife, offering all the human assistance you can in the divine delivery. So in the rest of our time, I want to offer a little lesson in church midwifery. How is a church born? And what can you do to wisely facilitate that birth? So our first point, those will be our, those will be our two points in the rest of our time. How is a church born and how should you facilitate that birth? Number one, how is a church born? We begin with the biology of a church's birth, even, if you will, the birds and the bees of a church's birth. If you're a church midwife, you need to know exactly how this new life is meant to emerge into the world. So theologically speaking, how is a church born? A church's birth takes place in two moments, two distinct, recognizable movements of God's grace. The first moment is the invisible act of regeneration in which God creates a people by granting them faith by his spirit to respond to the preaching of the gospel. I'll say that again, and I'm going to write it. How is the church born? Moment one. Better look at my notes. The first moment in a church's birth is the invisible act of regeneration, the new birth. in which God creates a gospel people by granting them faith comma by his spirit To respond to the preaching of the gospel. The first step in a church's birth is God's word going out and creating new spiritual life. God creates Christians by the preaching of the gospel. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Here's how Luke describes the growth of the church in Acts 12, 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God increased and multiplied as God granted more and more people faith to respond to the word. As Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 23, you have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. God's word has always created God's people. The same power that called the stars into being calls each new believer into being. We can no more create the church than we can create a galaxy. God speaks the church into life. So this first moment in the birth of the church is invisible. It happens whenever God grants someone repentance from sin and faith in Christ. Just like Jonathan said, in order to have a church, you need gospel people. People who have turned from sin and trusted in Christ. You don't have a church until you have Christians. But you don't have a church just because you have Christians. You don't even have a church if you have a bunch of Christians who all happen to attend the same weekly meeting. Something more needs to happen. Hence, there's a second moment in the birth of a church. A second necessary act. The second moment, I'll say it then I'll write it. The second moment is the visible act of congregation in which God's gospel people create a gospel polity through the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Here we go. Moment two. The visible act of congregation. Where are we? Hmm. The visible act of congregation in which God's gospel people create a gospel polity 
through the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's Supper. By polity here, I simply mean a unified corporate entity. I mean a whole as opposed to just parts. So the question here is, how do gospel people form a gospel polity? How do you cross the boundary between Christians and church? What is it that flips on the switch called church? And I want to briefly argue that the Bible's answer is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Consider baptism first. In Acts 2, 37, the crowd at Pentecost cries out in conviction, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 41 we read, And those who received his word... They're being granted faith. God is creating a gospel people. Those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. On the day of Pentecost, how did God's invisible work of regeneration become visible to the church? By believers being baptized. How did these new Christians become visible to each other? By being baptized. How was it that these new believers were added to the church? By being baptized. For a new convert, baptism is the New Testament way to join a church. Let's think for a moment also about Matthew 28, 19 to 20, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. To baptize someone is to identify them as belonging to the triune God. It is to publicly claim a person as God's property, to publicly identify a person as a member of God's family. So baptism is where faith goes public. It is the gathering point where God's invisible work of regeneration is made visible to the world and to the church. And from an individual believer's side, baptism is how a new believer publicly commits to Christ and his church. Baptism is where you sign on the dotted line marked, everything I have commanded you. So baptism doesn't just witness to a commitment. Baptism actually makes a commitment. In baptism, a Christian publicly claims God as his Father, Christ as his Savior and Lord, and God's people as his people. Let's turn to the Lord's Supper. One of the most important and neglected New Testament passages on ecclesiology, although Jonathan did not neglect it in his message, Jonathan mentioned it as well, is 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Start in verse 16. Paul says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Paul reminds us that to eat the bread and drink the cup is to enjoy fellowship with Christ and to experience the benefits of his death. From this vertical fellowship between Christ and believers, Paul draws a horizontal conclusion in verse 17. Because there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Paul says twice that the reason we are one body is that we partake of one bread. In other words, the Lord's Supper gathers up the we who are many, and it makes us one body. In this visible, congregating sense, the Lord's Supper constitutes a local church. In the Lord's Supper, our unity in Christ creates the unity of the church. In the Lord's Supper, we receive the benefits of Christ and we renew our commitment to Christ and to each other. That's why Paul can hold the Corinthians accountable for their divisive behavior at the Supper. To own Christ as your Savior by eating the Lord's Supper is to receive Christ's family as your brothers and sisters. To renew your fellowship with Christ in the Supper is to renew your submission to Him as Lord. So we can put both ordinances together by saying that baptism binds one to many, and the Lord's Supper makes many one. Baptism binds one to many, and the Lord's Supper makes many 
one. That's how the ordinances function, to take us from this invisible act of God, of creating Christians by his word and the power of the spirit, to this visible act of congregation, of believers coming together, joining together. This is still a work of God, a work enabled by God, a work carried out by God, and yet it's a work in which he works our response, our new covenant response. God creates Christians by the gospel. Christians together constitute the church by the signs of the gospel. Baptism and the Lord's Supper together are the means by which a gospel people form a gospel polity. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are how you get from Christians to church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are what combine Christians into the structure we call church membership. So baptism and the Lord's Supper make the church visible. They're the hinge, as just as Jonathan put it, they're the hinge between the invisible church and the visible congregation on earth. Baptism and the Lord's Supper draw a line around the church by drawing the church together. So we've seen that there are two moments in the birth of the church, invisible and visible, regeneration and congregation, God creating a gospel people and then those gospel people creating a gospel polity. Crucial to all of this, excuse me, crucial to all of this is the concept of commitment. In baptism, we publicly commit to Christ and to his people. And in the Lord's Supper, we renew our commitment to Christ and to each other. Church membership just is this relation of self-conscious commitment to one another. And in the strictest theological sense, baptism and the Lord's Supper are how we ratify that commitment. So how is the church born? A church is born when God recreates people through the gospel, and then those people commit to one another through the two visible signs of the gospel. That's how baby churches are born, folks. So what then does that mean for your role as church planters? Point number two, how should you facilitate the birth of a church? I'm not going to say everything there is to be said. I'm just going to focus on some nuts and bolts about crossing that boundary, coming together, constituting. I've got five brief points of application. Number one, you are trying to form a church, not attract a crowd. There's all the difference in the world between a weekly crowd and a local church. And that difference is fundamentally commitment. Are these people committing to one another? So getting this straight will radically reorder your ministry priorities. You should be far more concerned about whether people are Christians than about how many you have. You should be far more concerned about whether people are committed to the life of the body than about how much is in your church's bank account. You should be far more concerned about whether people are embracing their New Testament responsibilities for one another than about whatever numbers anyone expects you to report. A crowd is not a church, and a church is not always a crowd. Number two, the ordinances are essential to the birth of a church. Many things we think are essential are not. The ordinances are essential to the birth of a church. Many things we think are essential are not. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus says, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You don't have to have 50 people before you can have a church. You don't have to have a certain meeting space or worship team, budget. You just need people who commit to Christ and commit to each other. Which brings me to my third point. Number three, your goal in planting a church is bringing a group of Christians to self-consciously commit to each other. Until you have Christians who have committed to each other, you don't have a church. This means that in your church planting prospectus, whether you have one on paper or just a kind of mental plan, you should be preoccupied with what it will take to shepherd a group of people to that point of self-conscious commitment. Do they have sufficient theological unity to agree about the essentials of the gospel and what's necessary to preserve the gospel? Do they have sufficient clarity about what a church is, how it's structured, and who should be a member of it? Do they clearly understand the New Testament's teaching about our responsibility for one another? 
our accountability to each other, and the authority of the local church over Christian discipleship. You know, one brother was just sharing with me about some training he heard for pastors and planters in which church planters were encouraged not to pastor their people until the church reached a certain stage. Don't pastor until the church is well and truly planted. I'm trying to tell you the precise opposite, that pastoring is essential to gathering that team, forming that team, unifying that team, instructing that team, and bringing them to the point where they can make this commitment. That is your pastoral responsibility from day one. So you want to have your eyes open to whatever roadblocks might come in the way, whatever you are convinced is biblically essential to have as a church together, but people don't know. Maybe just through simple ignorance, maybe they haven't been taught, maybe they've been taught contrary to that, and you need to do some extra teaching to try to persuade people. Maybe you need to be okay with losing some members of your core team. If you start to clarify these things, the early you do that, the better you serve them. The truer you are in advertising up front, the kinder you are to those people. And the more explicit you are, the quicker the timeline to covenanting together. Whatever those roadblocks are in the way of that unity, in the way of those people committing to each other, that's where you want to invest lots of pastoral energy from day one. Number four, generally speaking, pursue the shortest possible timeline for covenanting. By covenanting, I mean your church hitting the second moment together, this act of congregation, self-consciously committing to one another and beginning to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Of course, details will vary by situation, but in general, make it your aim to lead your church to covenant together as soon as possible. I love how our brother Matt Diaz said, Lord willing, they'll be covenanting as a church in March. He's got a good core team. They seem unified behind his leadership. Lord willing, he'll return in January and just have a few weeks of teaching, of formation, of making sure everybody's on the same page, making sure everyone is comfortable committing to each other. I think that's beautiful. That's not how every church is going to work. Sometimes you're kind of starting from scratch, but to have it as your ambition to get to this point as soon as possible. As our brother Nathan Knight has written, I would suggest that you not talk so much about launching a church as if it were a spaceship. Instead, talk about covenanting. Launching is something that boats do or that aircraft do. Covenanting is something that people do. And we understand this. We make a marriage covenant. We make promises to each other. This is not foreign to the culture. It might not be right on the surface, but it's there. People can relate to it. Talk about covenanting as a church. And again, if you pursue the shortest possible timeline toward covenanting, then again, that will set your whole practical trajectory in a certain direction. What do I need to do for these 18 people? Oh, whoops, maybe we're down to 16 or 15. That's okay. What do I need to do to take these 34 people? Okay, turn, turns out it's kind of 28. That's all right. What do I need to do to get these people? What do I need to teach them? How do I need to lead them to a common mind about what it means to be a church together so that they can commit together? Brothers, you want to make that your plan and pathway from the beginning. You only want people getting on the church planting train who understand that you are headed as soon as possible to this kind of commitment to one another. Of course, it's fine for people to visit. It's fine for people to ask questions. It's fine for people to linger at the margins. That's totally okay, of course. But you don't want anyone to think they're on the train who doesn't actually want to head in that direction. You want to be crystal clear from the beginning that the church is constituted by our commitment to Christ and each other as we see in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Just another practical note here. Brothers who are church planters, I would encourage you not to treat the title church planter like a badge of honor. You're not special ops. You're not, the Navy, you're not the Navy SEALs of the Christian world. Even you, Brian, much as I love you, brother. Church planter sounds cool, but it actually means you're an evangelist who aspires to be a pastor, but who doesn't have a church yet. Part of moving toward this means aspiring to lose the title church planter as soon as the Lord allows, to graduate to the title of pastor. Amen? <laughs> glorying in the title church planter is just a little bit like glorying in being a teenager. The point is to grow up. Now, I'm not saying you brothers are immature. I'm just saying your goal is the maturity of your church. Your goal is the emergence of your church. You don't want to be in the process of planting for as long as possible. You want the roots to go down. You want the plant to come up and flourish and be strong. 
That's your goal. Work yourself out of the planter job as soon as possible. As many of our wives can well attest, you don't want the labor before birth to last any longer than it has to. Fifth and finally, when should you celebrate the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper? It's a very real, live question for tons of church planters. My basic answer is not until you have a church, not until you're ready for this second moment, this act of congregation. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of the church. Baptism should induct someone into the church, into the living relationship of local church membership. And the Lord's Supper is celebrated by the church, as a church, because it enacts the unity of the church. So if you're planting and someone comes to faith and you're wondering whether to baptize them, what do you do? Well, my basic answer is get a church as soon as possible. Hit this second moment as soon as possible so you have something to baptize them into. If you feel pressure there, if you feel tension and conflict, I think that's healthy. That's a good thing. That's a good sign. I would encourage you that the biblical way to relieve that pressure is to covenant as a church as soon as possible. I would even encourage you to take the Lord's Supper in your covenanting service. That's a longstanding Baptist practice, and I think it's a biblical one. It's an implication of what we're talking about here. When your church is ready to commit together, seal your commitment to one another in the ordinance Christ established for that purpose. The language specifically of covenanting may not be in the scripture, but I think it's implied when the church comes together and becomes one. (laughs) Hey, I appreciate the clarification. Now you don't have to ask that later. Brothers, you who are planting churches, I'm grateful to God for your labor as midwives. I pray that through you, he will bring many thriving baby churches into the world. That those baby churches would grow up to maturity. Every man mature in Christ. And I pray that he'll give us all wisdom to nourish the churches instructed to our care. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege of being your own co-workers in gospel ministry. We thank you that your work is the supreme one. Your work is the effectual one. Your work accomplishes your purposes by your word. Father, we pray that we would plant and water diligently. And we pray that you would richly give growth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.